Um, because remember, I told you guys that you have a couple of questions on the exam where you'll tell me what kind of ecology a question is addressing, whether it's population or organismal or ecosystem or whatever. Um, and then you'll give me justification. So it's different than those multiple choice questions that you guys have seen before because you actually have to write a little bit and, and sort of provide thought. So what I want to do is practice a few um, examples of sort of what that might look like and uh, do a few together. So we get an idea. So let's do that first and we'll get into chapter 47. Just in time. You heard the music, it came running, right? Yes. I thought so. Who doesn't like a good kid? I'm, I'm barely hanging on, guys. So if I'm goofy, forgive me. Hey, this man is Brandy Rogers. <laughs> Y'all are really messing with me now. <laughs> Uh, you guys. I hope I win. All right, is everybody in that wants to be? Can I hit start? I'm doing it. Okay. Now the sound's back. That's weird. But no music. Okay. All right. So studying interactions between osprey and bald eagles. Organismal population, ecosystem, or community. All right, so this is perfect because there's a spread of answers. So now I'm going to ask you guys for justification. If you said community ecology, why did you say that? Anyone want to venture to share? Two different populations, which are two different what? Species. species, right. So perfect. That would be all you would have to say. We're looking at interactions between two different species, which makes it community. Um, if you said population, do you want to give justification? Could you? Even if you didn't, even if that wasn't you, like, you don't want to say that with me, you don't have to. If you didn't say that, you could still make justification for why this could be population ecology. Can you think of an example? So I could argue that um, I am a population ecologist who is only studying the osprey, right? And I'm looking at their population to see how it's affected by competition or seasonal or something like that. You guys see what I'm saying? So you can get creative if you want to with your answers. Okay? Kind of hope you do. And then if you were going to say organismal, could you say something similar? Like I want to see how this particular osprey is doing this nesting season. Would that be legit? Sure. So that's Just the idea. The okay. Hmm? Just not all the text. <laughs> yeah, no, you can't. That's it. You can say whatever you want. That's what these questions are going to be open ended. Okay. So it'll be just like that. Only the um, explanation will be longer. So you'll have more to work with. Yeah. So I'll ask you guys to give me justification using information from the question. On the cahoots, they're short because I'm limited on characters, kind of like Twitter or whatever, right? But um, I can make a paragraph if I want to on text. So I can tell you a story about the interaction between the osprey and the bald eagle, and then you tell me what, what kind of ecology it is and why. So yeah, there really isn't a wrong answer. I mean, I guess you could 
try really hard <laughs> to be wrong, but just I just want to see thought, right? So that yeah, they're open ended. So on the test, really, it's it's the same as as the thing. So we're just practicing those types of questions. Okay, measuring energy and biomass in a trophic pyramid representing an African grasshopper. <laughs> And everybody went with ecosystems. How come? Because it includes non-living. What's non-living in this in this energy? Yeah, sure. Good. And biomass, we're talking about uh, nutrients, really, right? What do the organisms do with the energy and nutrients that they obtain? And we're talking about trophic pyramids, right? When we're talking about energy flow, we're talking about ecosystems. That's it. That would be harder to justify some of the other answers, but I could get the drift. Using life tables to study demographics of a group of mountain goats. Population, why do you say that? One who was talking about the other day? The group, just, population. just the population, and then what do you say? Just one species. Just one species. Yeah. So that one's pretty straightforward. Uh, life tables, and we covered life tables when we did population ecology, so that might be a clue as well. Um, if you chose organismal, could you justify it? How could you justify it? By the way, you're nodding. I'm forgetting. If you're just doing one species, if it's just a specific species, and you can look at a very very small population. Maybe you're looking at a familial group, or maybe you're looking at sort of how that particular organism does one thing, right? So that could be, you could justify that as well, absolutely. Remember, it's all overlapping. Ecology is the, the giant overlap, right? It's all interaction. Studying succession in the Okefenokee swamp after a wildfire. Hmm. All right, so ecosystem ecology is popular. Why do you guys choose that one so so strongly? Should be studying the whole ecosystem. Yeah, you're studying the whole ecosystem. What in here makes the ecosystem? What's non-living? Yeah, the fire, right? Um, could you say community? Because I put succession, right? And we talked about succession as a as a measure of sort of community dynamics. So. Pick and choose the parts of the question. I just want to see that you learned something about something about ecology. Okay, that's the idea. All right, we have two more to go. Heavy rains increase seed production, leading to an increase in mouse populations and an outbreak of pathovirus cases. You go crazy with this one. All right, so let's go start with ecosystem first. Those of you who chose ecosystem, Michael. They just include so many different parts between the non living rain, um, seed production, so just fauna, and then also everything else, because it includes mice and uh, the virus. So yeah, it's pretty broad, right? That's a really broad topic to be looking at. Um, what if you chose community? If you chose community, how would you justify that? You got two different species in there, maybe? Who do you have? Yeah, whatever plant, those seeds they're coming from, and the mice. So sure, right? How does the increase in seeds affect the population of the mice? What about population? Could you justify that? Yeah, if you were looking at just the mouse population, maybe it affects mice. Yeah, how does the mouse interact with the mouse population interact with this environment? What about, could you even do a human population study? Humans aren't mentioned in here, but how do we sort of indirectly get to the human component? The virus. Yeah, so hot the virus, right? That's a, a human disease. Um, could you go organismal? What if you're studying the virus itself? This is kind of fun, don't you think? Good questions are ones that don't have wrong answers. Studying distribution patterns of monarch butterflies during migration. Population 
population is a, is a popular answer. I would I would probably choose that first if I were making the justification. So why would you say that? Yeah, you're just looking at one species. You're looking at species distribution patterns, right? That was a population ecology sort of level question. Um, community. Anybody want to justify community? Oh, okay. Well, that's fair. <laughs> but I think you could, especially if you had more information, like what you might see on the test, right? Because monarchs are going to are going to follow a really specific migration pattern because they have particular host plants that they use, right? So you could look at milkweed distribution and monarch distribution and call it community, right? So you guys see what's going to happen on the test. It's not going to be hard. I just want to see, I'm going to do something a little different to just see where you guys land with that. Okay. Let's talk about conservation and biodiversity for a little while. I kind of wish we started with ecology because some of this stuff is really fun to talk about and interesting and relevant and many people are interested in careers in natural resource management, things like that. So we all mix it up one day and start, start with this stuff first and do, I don't know, biodiversity last or something. All right, here is the return of relative species abundance that I have also been uh, alluding to that would eventually happen. So here's where we're going to do a few calculations and look at how you use uh, relative abundance as a measure of biodiversity compared to using species richness as a measure of biodiversity. And you're going to tell me which, is, which community is uh, more diverse. Right? So that's just going to be also some practice. You'll see questions like this on the test as well. So just coming back to what we talked about, we first defined biodiversity as just how many species, what's the variety of living organisms in the place that you're looking. So you could be doing a biodiversity survey of say, Pettit Environmental Preserve, right? One particular group of organisms on a small tract of land. You could be looking at North America, right? You could be looking at fish in the Pacific Ocean. And right? you can do biodiversity at all the different levels um, but what you're just looking at is who's there, what's the variety, and how many um, individuals of each species. So the two measures, again, that we're comparing are species richness and relative species abundance. So if you guys remember what is species richness? It's the simpler of the two measures to use. Anybody recall that? If I want to measure species richness, all I have to do is find out what species are there and count those the number of species, okay? So if you have, uh, if we're looking at this community of uh, this forest community here, how many species do you see labeled there? Four. That's your species richness. Pretty easy, right? You just count who's there. Um, when you go into doing relative abundance, you want to find out how much of your community is made up of each of those species, okay? Because this is going to show us also a measure of biodiversity in a community. So um, what you do to calculate relative abundance is you take the number of individuals of one species that you're trying to calculate the abundance for, and you take it over the total number of individuals of all the species in the community. It's just a fraction. It's very straightforward, as long as you remember what you're, what you're trying to do. So if we look at community one, um, we have four species, right? How many total number, how many total individuals do we have in total trees? Can you count real quick? Does it 20? Yeah, 20. Okay, probably 20. Makes sense. So, how many out of that 20? So, now we have our denominator. You guys with me? Total number of all the species, 20 trees in this community. How many of those are species A in community one? Five? Sorry? What's it? It doesn't matter. Whatever you want to tell me. Five, yeah, five out of 20. So that gives us 25%, right? That, my friends, is your relative abundance of species A. Not hard, right? Same thing with B. There are obviously five, right? Because we got the percentages already. Same with C, same with D. So we have 25% relative species abundance for, abundance for each species in this community. What about two? If you count the trees, there are still 20. Okay, so the same, they are the same size. What about richness? How many species are present in community two? Also four. So your richness is equal in both communities, right? That's fair. 
Okay, what if we look at abundance, relative abundance? Species A makes up 80% of this community. So if you count the total number of species A, what do you get? That's 80% of 20. 16. Thank you. I told you I'm fairly hanging on. Um, so you got 16 species A out of 20, that gives you 80%. And then how many of species B are there? Is it B? This one? This one. One lone species B, so one out of 20, which gives you 5%. And then same with C, here's this guy. And then there are two of species B, which gives you 10% of points. So then you have a different uh, uh, spread, right, of relative abundance. The question then becomes, which of these two communities is more diverse? So they're using this as a measure of, of biodiversity, right? What do you guys think? Is, is community one more diverse or is community two more diverse? Yeah. You say one, justify. Yeah, it's worth an even spread, right? So if you look at the diversity of community two, this thing is overrun, right, by species A. If you walk into this forest, there's an 80% chance that the first tree you see is species A. Whereas here, it's diverse. So why do we care? Why does it matter? Let's say you're a conservation biologist, okay? And let's say that you are tasked with preserving one tract of land, either the tract of land that contains this forest or the tract of land that contains that forest. And you don't have money to do both, so that's off the table. You have to pick one. You can use species abundance, relative abundance, as a measure of biodiversity to choose. So which one would you pick? Is it more valuable to preserve this one with a higher relative abundance or a more evenly spread relative abundance and therefore a higher biodiversity or one that's mostly tree A? Why do you say that? Because in that small area you can preserve more like multiple species as opposed to primarily just one and the other ones would eventually probably just get away. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So there's more of a diversity. You're preserving more species um, and genetic diversity variation, right? By preserving this little tract of land that holds community one, whereas in community two, we don't necessarily even know why species A is overrunning the place. Maybe it's an invasive, right? Maybe it's something that's out competing the natural stuff, right? And this isn't always going to be the end all of how you make your decisions because what if species A is your target species and the rest of these are the rest of these are invasive. And this one's doing really good. So maybe you, you preserve that track. But that's an exception. Right. So the idea here is that you can use relative abundance as a measure of diversity. And as a conservation uh, professional, that's your whole goal is preserving biodiversity. And okay? we're going to sort of talk about why going forward. Um, here is just some more practice. But I think you guys can do this on your own. I think that the fraction stuff is pretty straightforward, but if you guys want to do this before your exam, it's a really good example of a question that you might see. Right, so you go on a birding trip to the boreal forest of Canada. Uh, here's your data from the day. Calculate the relative abundance for each of the species. Okay, so that's pretty easy. You guys can do that, right? We don't need to do it together. I think we'll skip it, but go practice if you want to make sure that you're comfortable for doing that on the exam. Um, so I will ask you to calculate something like that, and then I'll probably ask you to tell me what does that mean. I might ask you an open-ended question, if I go crazy, right, and ask you to tell me what do you think that means for the pine grows peak. Tell me something, okay? So that's what I want you guys to be able to do. Um, and then this is also uh, tying back into the Asian carp thing, which remember was a Easter egg for your bonus questions. So thinking about the whole Asian carp story, once again, I'm not gonna go through that. I also want you to look at that on your own if you have time, um, because you may see some bonus questions on that for the exam. There. All right, um, measures of biodiversity, besides looking at just how many species or relative abundance, you can look at other things, um, and we'll sort of talk about why these things matter. So genetic diversity is gonna be variation, right? Just gen um, diversity at the DNA level, um, variation is important. You guys already know this. This is old news from two years ago when we started this class. Required for adaptation and evolution, right? If, you're, if you don't have any genetic variation in a the population, then nobody in that population that has any advantage or disadvantage. Things change and everyone's affected the same way. You have less ability to adapt, less and less ability to evolve as a species. 
um, of the population. So we know that that's important um, for the health of a, of a community or the health of a population. Right? If you have all the individuals in the population are genetically identical, that's not ideal. So again, tying it into working with conservation. Um, have you guys ever heard of the field of conservation genetics? Can you imagine what that might look like? What might you do as a conservation geneticist? You're probably trying to do reproduction. So think about this. How about captive breeding? You guys know what that is? When you take something that is uh, endangered in the wild and you bring it into a zoo or an aquarium or whatever, a lab or something, and you're trying to keep the population going. Would you perhaps um, analyze the genomes of the individuals, right? You would, sure, because you want to know how different from one another are they. If they're identical genetically or really close, then you're more likely to have problems from things like inbreeding depression. You guys remember that from also two years ago? Yeah, the more closely related individuals are, the more likely you are to have recombination that leads to um, recessive alleles that are potentially harmful. Uh, that's inbreeding depression. So you got to watch out for that when you're doing um, conservation work. We also consider genetic diversity because of chemical diversity, because genes code for proteins, right? And proteins are just things that we produce in our cells, and those things can make up chemical compounds, and those compounds can be useful, right? So something like half of all the pharmaceuticals that we use have originally come from plants. Something crazy like that. That statistic may be a little off, but um, there's a lot, right? We learn a lot from compounds that are made by not just plants, but also animals and other, uh, let's say, fungi, like yeast and things, right? So we use them frequently for medicines. We talked about foxglove. That's one of those um, plants that makes, oh, I actually have a picture of it. You guys remember this guy? Makes, uh, makes the compound to pr protect itself from herbivory. But we use it um, to make the Jackson, which is a heart medication. Um, Epidivitide comes from the pygmy rattlesnake. The venom of the pygmy rattlesnake is a hemolytic. It helps to uh, break up blood. But you can also use this compound to make things like blood thinners. Okay, so we're getting medications from organisms. If we don't protect those organisms, we may never discover the compounds that they're capable of producing that we can then use to our own advantage. So it's important from a sort of selfish standpoint as well, right? To look at uh, chemical diversity and genetic diversity. Make sense? So this is my pitch on why you care. Um, but it's good to think about. Um, ecosystem diversity. This is the total other end of the spectrum, right? Rather than looking at molecular uh, variation, you can look at variation at the ecosystem level. So something like uh, the prairie ecosystem in North America. You guys ever seen a prairie, like a real prairie? Maybe, maybe not. There's not that much of it left. Mostly, when you think about prairie, you think about the Midwest. What's in the Midwest of the United States? Hmm? The little house. The little house on the prairie. That was probably still prairie back then. Um, what's out there now? If you drive through Kansas or Oklahoma, mostly corn, corn, maybe soy. Right? But you're going to see huge swaths of agriculture, right? usually monoculture, big, huge corn fields and big, huge soy, soy fields. So all of the diversity that used to be out there in the prairie ecosystem is gone, and now there's just corn or suburbs or both. <laughs> okay, so the entire ecosystem that used to span from Canada to Mexico all the way up the middle of North America is essentially gone. So you lose species of grass, you lose species of wildflowers, you lose species of uh, large grazing mammals like buffalo, right? So it's an entire ecosystem that's basically gone. We, we didn't do it because we're jerks, right? Although you can make the argument that we are rather thoughtless or we lack foresight often, right? As a species, we're very um, interested in progress, which makes sense. We have a lot of people to feed. We have a lot of things to do. I get it, right? We, we all get it. But without the foresight to think what happens when I take all this ecosystem out, we tend to sort of ruin things and then look back and go, whoops, whoops, there's no more prairie, right? Um, there's a reason that we did that because the prairie ecosystem, because of the grasses that grow really quickly and because of the tendency towards wildfire, the, the um, soil is super rich. 
So when we started moving, settlers started moving out towards the Midwest, Little House on the Prairie style, and started planting things. And we're like, oh my gosh, this soil is super fertile. But then we farmed it to death, right? Because it worked. So that's what happened with the prairie ecosystem, but that's just an example of why it's important to sort of consider all of the major interactions. Okay, so that's ecosystem level. So just to give you two major sort of swings from the molecular to the ecosystem level of sort of why we care about um, diversity. Look at this, another map. Does this look familiar? This looks like something we've seen before, right? This is a biodiversity uh, pattern map. So if you read the little caption, this map illustrates the number of amphibian species. So now we're looking at amphibians. We've looked at net primary productivity on a map that looks very similar to this. We looked at um, mammals, mammal distribution on a map that wasn't too dissimilar, basically just looking for patterns, but you see that same sort of striping, right? Latitude correlated um, with diversity. So where are your highest levels of amphibian biodiversity? Around the equator, right? Again, it's the same pattern that we've seen as we've been looking at all these different maps. And as you get towards the poles, what happens to number of amphibian species? Yeah, it flies, right? Just like we've seen with mammals and just like we've seen with net primary productivity, which is essentially plants, right? Plant species in abundance. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. We already kind of know that. Um, I think we, one topic we haven't talked about yet is biodiversity hotspots. I don't think we've really touched on this too much yet, but a hotspot is a geographical area, so somewhere on the map, which has a high number of endemic species. Do you guys remember what endemic means? Yeah, unique to a specific environment. That's a good way to define it. Um, um, so these are areas of the world, they're usually pretty small. In, uh, scopes, geographical scope size, and um, have a high number of endemic species, but also significant risk of loss to those species. So something is going on in those places that's threatening that diversity. So maybe um, it's habitat destruction, your development or pollution, or who knows what, right? So uh, the criteria to be classified as a hotspot by Conservation International, which is the group that sort of does these classifications, is you have to have 1,500 or more endemic species. That's a lot. Right, that's a 1500 species that only occur right there in that tiny little place and has to be 70% disturbed. That's also pretty hot, right? So you have to be pretty clearly threatening a whole lot of endemic species to be called um, a biodiversity hotspot, and 34 of them currently exist, according to Conservation International. If you look at this also, even more sort of interesting, um, these 34 hotspots cover 2.3%, 2%. Of Earth's surface, but have endemic to them 42% of terrestrial vertebrate species and 50% of the world's plants in 2% of the total area. That's pretty crazy, right? So that's what a hotspot is. It's a little tiny area that has a ton of biodiversity, but unfortunately, it's threatened. Okay, so that's just something that we look at um, when you are making conservation decisions, right? The thing about conservation work is that it is it, you have to get funding from somewhere. Um, and just like lots of different things in science, it's hard to come by. It can be difficult to come by, it's limited. What, what do you, can you guys, before I just tell you, what can you guess why there might be limited funding for conservation work? Any ideas? What if you compare conservation biology to medical research? Which one do you think gets more funding? Medical research, right? Why? Interest. Interest. Absolutely. So this whole lecture where I'm telling you why we care, why it matters, how we measure it, what we need to save this stuff, we need to save this stuff. You've got to convince people, right, that conserving your natural resources is actually beneficial and profitable in the long run. But like I said, we tend to be fairly short-sighted in terms of progress and uh, the cheese, right, making the money. So. It's an interesting conundrum. It's a it's a good field. It's an interesting field. If you're passionate about it, it can be really rewarding, but it can also be very frustrating because you have to try to figure out how to convince people um, to give you money to do this kind of work. So it's important as a biologist to understand that all of the moving parts and pieces that go into deciding how to use that money if and when you do get it. Right? If you work for an organization that has funding, something like 
the Sierra Club or Nature Conservancy or Conservation International or IUCN or something like that, right? So there's a lot of um, discussion and decisions that go into figuring out what do we do with the limited resources that we have to do conservation work. So hotspots is just a piece of that. All right, so what if we don't do any? What if we conserve nothing? Well, there's evidence that we're in the midst of an extinction event, a mass extinction event. So before we get to talking about that, let's talk about the ones that have come before. So if you look back through geologic time, there are these extinction events that represent endpoints at these major uh, markers in the geologic time scale. So um, there is the end Ordovician extinction, the end Devonian, Here's N Permian, N Triassic, and N Cretaceous. There, you don't have to know the dates on all of these. I do want you to know uh, the details that are included here for the N Permian and the N Cretaceous. I mean, they're important ones and they're all important. They're mass extinction events. In order to be, um, but let me, before I jump too far ahead, they're all important. They're all mass extinction events, but you don't have to know the details of any of them other than Permian and Cretaceous. Okay. That's what I was trying to say. Um, but what makes them all mass extinction events is that um, sudden and dramatic disappearances of high numbers of species are seen in the fossil record. So you see a whole lot of different stuff in the fossil record, and then all of a sudden, extinction occurrences jump. Okay, so that's what you're looking at here. This is millions of years before today, and extinction occurrence in uh, percentages. So you see some variation here. Things are going pretty well for a few million years, and then in the Ordovician, it's a sudden spike in extinctions. Okay, things disappear from the fossil record. Obviously, we weren't here to see it, so we're basing this totally on geographic, uh, geologic evidence, fossils, right? And rock strata. So you can see also changes. You guys know what strata are? You're going to see strata by lakes, yeah. So if you dig, if you pick a slice, like if you look at a cliff, right, it's a slice into the earth, and you can sort of see, sometimes if you're looking at sedimentary, you can even see the layers, right, the different colors. So if you go through those rock, rock layers, you can find in different layers, different types of organisms in the fossil record, right? So if you're going from one layer to the next layer, and you're seeing all this diversity of species, and all of a sudden you hit a stratum that has a whole lot fewer, Species, that's where you find, okay, this must have been a mass extinction event. Okay, it doesn't mean in a single day, because we're talking geologic time scale here, so it can be over 10 million years, 50 million years, right? It can be a really long period of time, and it often is, but what you see is that drastic lo um, loss of biodiversity. So that's, what we're, that's how we're defining these mass extinction events. The reason that I want you guys to know the end permian and the end Cretaceous, is because these are the two that we sort of talk about the most and that have to get the most press, if you will. And Permian, you can guess why that one's important. What do you think? Almost everything died. This is the Great Dying. That's the other name for the End Permian. Largest extinction event, estimates of up to 96% of marine species. So almost everything in the ocean and 70% of terrestrial species were lost. That's a lot. That is a huge bottleneck in global biodiversity. You see what I mean by a bottleneck? Everything died. And everything that has come since then is descended from the survivors of the intermediate. Okay, so you see extinction events, but then frequently you see radiation, right? Adaptive radiation, niches to fill, room to evolve, so the survivors can uh, expand and multiply and adapt. Okay, so you start to see diversity explode again after these extinction events. We don't really know why this happened. So there's lots of scientists, scientists working on looking at these things. Uh, one hypothesis is widespread volcanic activity leading to runaway global warming. Okay, so volcanoes, remember when we talked about last time, we talked about how digging up and burning fossil fuels is sort of like our equivalent to volcanoes erupting. So this is a natural thing that would happen. But what happens with, you, with runaway global warming is that you get so much volcanic activity going on that it starts to get hot and then it just can only get hotter. It's like plasma feedback. Okay, so that's one of the um, hypotheses is the, is the um, runaway global warming. But we don't really know. But that's the great dying. The other one I want you to know because up until now, which is where we might be in the, in the midst of the sixth, 
Um, the fifth one is the M Cretaceous. We also sometimes call it the KPD. Okay, uh, Cretaceous starts with the C. I realize that, but the K stands for Cretaceous, and PG stands for Paleogene because that's where we are now. So the KPG boundary is that line right there at M Cretaceous, the M Cretaceous extinction. Um, this one is significant not only because it's the most recent, but it's also the one where the dinosaurs went extinct. The major, large dinosaurs like T. Rex and relatives. Okay, who survived? Hmm? Small mammals. Uh, what about dinosaurs? Birds, right? The lineage that gave rise to birds, absolutely. Um, this one is also interesting because we figured this one out. We actually know why it happened. Anybody know off the top of your head? Asteroid, yep. Um, now understood to be the result of cataclysmic asteroid impact off the Yucatan and then survived. Um, they found the huge crater. They found evidence of um, iridium in the rock strata when it landed. So it's that is basically space dust, like rock that you find only on asteroids and not very frequently on Earth. But they discovered a stratum of rock that had incredibly elevated levels of iridium, which lent uh, credibility to the hypothesis of the cataclysmic asteroid. They found the iridium first, and then they found the crater. And they were like, oh, it's most of the time. So um, that's what killed the dinosaurs at the end Cretaceous. Still, still also a major extinction event, not as bad as the Permian, the same thing, but still fairly um, impactful. So that's historical. So how are we in the midst of the sixth mass extinction? Well, we're losing species at a rapid rate. And remember, these extinctions didn't happen overnight, right? It happened over a period of time. So if you start looking at the number of species that we are losing in modern history, um, Stretch it out over a million years or so, and you may see something that looks like this: this loss of biodiversity. Um, the figures are fairly are fairly staggering as far as uh, number of things that are going extinct now. We said how many percent of amphibians are at risk because of just um, chytridiomycosis, like thirty percent, right? Thirty percent of vertebrates are threatened because of habitat loss, right? So we're we're doing a pretty good job at cranking up the sixth mass extinction. So we're talking about the Pleistocene first. This is during the Paleogene epoch, okay? So this is during our modern time. The Pleistocene happened only about uh, 50,000 years ago or so. This is the Ice Age. So if you guys have ever seen the movies, the Ice Age movies, you know what I'm talking about, where there are like little mammoths and things like that? That's during the Pleistocene. Um, towards the end of this era, you start to see the loss of all these megafauna from the fossil record. 40 to 50,000 years ago in Australia, you see the last of the marsupial lions. Can you imagine a marsupial lion? What do they, what do they marsupial lion have? A pouch, like a kangaroo, right? Um, a one-ton wombat. That would be interesting to see. Giant kangaroos. These guys all disappeared about 40 to 50,000 years ago, interestingly, coincide with the arrival of Homo sapiens. So man gets there and megafauna disappears. Why do you think? Hmm? Mostly. Okay. Most, most likely, right? So again, we don't know. Here's some of the, that is a hypothesis, right? Hypotheses include extinction by overhunting. There are other uh, climate related hypotheses. People are still looking into it, right? It's interesting stuff we need to know about it. Probably some combination of events, right? Or factors. Um, here at home in North America, this only happened about 10 or 12,000 years ago, coinciding with the arrival of Homo sapiens on this continent, um, including the woolly mammoth that used to be here, the mastodon, the giant beaver, giant ground sloth. Did you guys know there was a giant ground sloth fossil found over off of um, Lads Mountain here in Hartsville? Pretty, pretty interesting to think about. Um, and the saber tooth, saber -tooth cats. So those were all here 10,000 years ago. That's not that long ago, right? If you think about geologic time. Um, so this is one of the major sort of markers of this sixth mass extinction event. So if you're counting millions of years, um, 50,000 years ago, counts. Right? So this is sort of part of what we're talking about here. But even more recently, we have what we call the Holocene extinction. Um, the Holocene is also sometimes referred to as the Anthropocene. You guys recognize the root word in Anthropocene? Anthro, what does that mean? Human, yep. So um, this is the period of time that we live in now, the Holocene, but there is a whole group of geologists and um, anthropologists and sociologists and archaeologists and other groups that have 
made the case that we should rename it the Anthropocene because of the impact of humans on the Earth in this period of time. Okay, so um, this is due to our activities, modern Homo sapiens, right? Um, numerous extinctions are coincident with European colonial expansion since the 1500s. So this is super recent stuff, not even 10,000 years ago, but only 500 or so. Um, so we look at the IUCN Red List, which you guys are probably familiar with from having done some of your research papers on these uh, threatened species, but this is a list that describes and characterizes species according to their extinction risk. So are they a least concern? Are they uh, threatened? Are they endangered? Are they critically endangered? Are they extinct in the wild, et cetera, right? So this is, um, this is the group that keeps up with that thing, with those things. Uh, we have 380 extinct vertebrate species since 1500. 380 species of vertebrates gone since 1580. Directly related, some of them, to overhunting and overfishing. So we just kill everything, right? Again, it's not necessarily that we set out to be destructive as a species, but we are short-sighted, right? So when you wander onto an island like Madagascar, in the 1600s, you're a sailor, you've been at sea all this time, you get on to the island of Madagascar, you see this goofy looking bird, right? It's pretty big, it moves fairly slowly, it isn't scared of you because it's never seen a person before, so it did not co-evolve with people. So they walk onto the island and they say, look at this stupid thing, let's call it the dodo, right? And then they killed all of them and ate them, mostly. Um, they also, sailors going to Madagascar in the 1600s also brought animals with them, domestic animals like dogs and cats, which were also really good at killing dodos. Because guess what else dodos had never seen before? Dogs and cats, right? So that's where that story. Um, stellar sea cow is another good example. This thing, this huge, massive uh, relative of things like the West Indian manatee, the other two manatees down in Florida, maybe. Uh, stellar sea cow is a huge relative of those. We found them, uh, let's see, 1768 minus 27, 1741. We discovered the stellar sea cow, stellar sea cow and in, that, in 1768, it was extinct. We just overhunted them. They're huge, they're blubbery, they're good for meat, they're good for fat, and we then hunted them all today. 27 years. That's pretty impressive, right? Um, and then our friend here, the passenger pigeon. The last one died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. Interestingly, before that time, these things were so numerous that there were contests to see who could kill the most in one day. There were so many passenger pigeons that when they would migrate over, it would take three days for the flock to get to completely pass by. Okay, so think about this. For three days, the sun is blocked by birds just migrating over. Think about the weight that is dropping from these birds. Think about when they land in your cornfield, right? So these were considered a huge nuisance. So there were contests. Who can shoot the most passenger pigeons? And at the end of the day, there would be people who had mountains, like piles of dead pigeons. Okay, it was like a sport. Um, and then there were none. Then there was one. And this one died in the zoo in 1914. So that's the whole idea of being short sighted, right? Let's kill them all. There will always be more. Well, until there aren't, right? So that's the kind of thing that we're looking at with these endangered species. And these are just three of the examples out of the 86 that we can directly tie to human um, activities. What do you think about the rest? Do you think they're completely unrelated to human activity? Probably not, right? But there's no direct uh, overhunting or overfishing for it. So this number might be higher now, I'm not sure. These statistics came out of your textbook, it's a couple years old, so it might have changed some since then. Um, but these are the types of things that conservation biologists look at. Not here to be, just tell you sad stories about why this stuff. But it's good to know, right? It's good to sort of know what, we, what we're up against. All right, so why do we care? Why does it matter? We talked about some of the reasons, genetic variation, ecosystem uh, diversity. But what if, what if you're trying to convince someone to give you money to save an endangered species or to look at preserving an endangered habitat somewhere? Um, so here's some good arguments, evidence-based arguments. So we talked a little bit about human health. Medicines derived from these compounds that are produced by organisms. We talked about that chemical diversity, right? 
So secondary plant compounds, animal toxins, we talked about the epiphytes and the rattlesnakes, uh, the bacterial and fungal metabolic byproducts. Can you think of a fungal metabolic byproduct that's been incredibly important in uh, species and species? What am I trying to say? Increasing carrying capacity for humans? Penicillin, right? Antibiotics, exactly. Um, about a third of pharmaceutical research and development money is spent on natural compounds, looking for new things. Okay, to try to treat diseases, and 35% of new drugs marketed between 81 and 20, uh, 2002, 2002 were derived from natural compounds. This doesn't mean that all those drugs came directly from a natural compound, but that we learned how to make it from looking at the chemical structure of natural compounds. Does that make sense? So that's what I was talking about when I say we learn from uh, the chemicals that are being made by natural organisms. How about the psychological benefit? You just feel good in nature. Agree or disagree? That's a little harder to prove, right? Or to support with evidence. However, there is plenty of research in the social sciences that um, support the hypothesis that natural environments help promote well being and decrease stress. So if you're freaking out at the end of the semester, um, and your life is spiraling out of control, go for a walk. Go for a walk in the woods, right? Um, but I put a book here, a book chapter as an example, and a uh, publication from a psychology journal just to show you that there is science out there that supports that hypothesis. Um, agriculture is a huge one, and we've touched on this before when we were talking about plant diversity and why it's important to, to preserve that, but we need to maintain genetic diversity of our crop species. What happens, we just said, if you have a monoculture where everything is genetically identical, there's no variation, and a, a new, let's say a new fungal pest evolves that attacks your food source. Nobody's resistant, everybody's the same while your food is not. That's what happened with the potato famine, you guys. Remember we talked about Phytophthora back in the Photos chapter ages ago? Um, it was all potatoes. But all the potatoes were susceptible, and a million people starved to death, and another million people moved from uh, out of Ireland. So that's the kind of thing that we need to be uh, cognizant of going forward. If we don't have that diversity in our crop species, um, there's no way to introduce adaptation, and there's also a new way to uh, develop new gene variants. Because regardless of how you feel about genetically modified foods, that is how we're feeding all the billions of people on the planet. Right? And we learn how to modify crops from looking at the genomes of other related species. Right? So if you can find a, a gene that, in, that introduces some sort of resistance to drought, then you can modify, I don't know, soy to contain that gene. Then you can grow soy in drier places. You see what I'm saying? So we need to know where these traits that we like in our crops come from in order to make new ones, or at least make educated decisions on preserving the genetic variation that we do have. Um, so that's important. And then you got our pollinators, which will be related but totally different topic. What do pollinators do? Why are they important? Yeah, they pollinate. That's what they do, right? What does that mean? They fertilize. Yeah, they fertilize plants. They take pollen, which is contains the sperm cells of plants, to a flower of another plant, right? And then that's the way you get seeds, and seeds are the only way you get fruit. Right, flowers, fruits, seeds, so those types of things, and that's where our food comes from. So, without pollinators, you don't have plant reproduction and you don't have enough food to feed everybody. So, you got to watch out for things like your bees, right, and your butterflies and birds. All right, so that's agriculture. Um, wild food sources is important. Many populations rely on wild fish populations to remain source of protein, so that's important, right, especially in coastal places or other countries where the whole economy is built on fishing. Um, and then finally, the warm and fuzzy, the moral benefit. So many people believe that humans have a responsibility to care for other organisms on the planet. So that's probably the hardest sell, right? It's the right thing to do. So that depends on who you, who you are telling, right? Some people care, some people do not. You with me? Um, what do you guys think? Do you think it's our responsibility to look out for taking care of our natural resources. I mean, who else is going to do it, right? And who is the only species capable of uh, exploiting them to the degree that we are? It's us, right? So yeah, I think so. I think you could make the case. 
And it doesn't have to just be the warm and fuzzy, like don't have a tree. It can also be, listen, it is our responsibility because we depend on natural resources to keep us all alive. Right? So it can be moral and self serving, I think, to probably make that, uh, make that case. All right, how are we doing? Are we good? All right, these are all threats that we've talked about. Okay, so I'm not going to harp on these too much. We already know what habitat loss means, right? How do we um, how do we go about destroying habitats? Hmm? Logging. Logging. Development. Development. All the things. Progress, right? Progress. Yeah. So we don't just go out and say, "I hate these turtles so much, I'm just going to ruin their habitat," right? But you do it in the name of progress or development or for some sort of natural reason. Um, over harvesting, that's just taking more than the, the economy of the economy, the environment can um, sustain, right? So interestingly, there's a there's a concept called the tragedy of commons. And I don't think we've talked about this too much before. Um, but this basically means if you don't own something, you have less motivation to take care of it than something that actually belongs to you that you have economic interest in. Okay. So the problem with um, overharvesting and it's specifically with overfishing in aquatic um, organisms is that water, nobody necessarily owns it, right? You get a certain distance off the coast and then those are international waters. Nobody is responsible for taking care of that stuff because nobody actually owns it, right? It's the common, it's a common resource. And the tragedy of that is that without the motivation of it being yours to own and to value and to have an economic interest in, there's no point in, in saving it, right? There's no interest for you personally to take care of it. And so everyone just says over exploits, and that's the tragedy of the problem. So now you know. Um, exotic species we've talked about before. What can happen with exotic species? They get released. Yeah, they get released and then they can become invasive. Um, we've talked some about that. So uh, sometimes it's on purpose, sometimes it's pet trade, sometimes we're moving something for landscaping, who knows? Sometimes it's an accident. Um, tiger mosquitoes, the really itchy ones that get you here in Georgia, they're not native, those are Asian, right? But they came over in, um, originally they think they came in tire shipments. So like rubber tires on ships. The rubber tires hold water, right? If it rains and there's little bits of water and that's all you need for an Asian, Asian tiger mosquito to breed is a little bit of standing fresh water. So that's how they think they actually got it. Nobody brought them on purpose, but because of our lifestyle, because of our uh, economy, our global, globally connected economy, things move, right? And sometimes you have stowaways, right? They weren't intentional. So it can be, um, it can be a total accident. And then we also have, of course, climate change, which is the last thing we'll talk about here. Um, this is what I promised you guys we would get to. I'm so glad we made it this far. To talk about why does climate change affect bio, bio, why do we why do we study climate change in biology? How does it affect biodiversity? And here are a couple of examples of how that can work. Okay, so ecosystems, as we know, are characterized by patterns of temperature and precipitation. How warm is it? How often does it rain? We looked at the maps, right? We know that there are different ecosystems that have different characteristics and the organisms that live there are well adapted to those norms, right? Norms of rainfall, norms of temperature. If it gets warmer overall, right? If the global temperature on average is getting warmer and staying warmer longer, colder climates will shift towards the poles, right? Because it's warmer around the equator. So you have basically like encroaching warmth. So it stays warmer farther north for longer in the year. So your colder climates are retreating, okay? So if you have an organism that is uh, adapted to those polar climates, it's going to try to move with those norms because the environment is changing faster than what organisms can adapt to. Does that make sense? So something like a grizzly bear that's adapted to a particular type of uh, environmental condition is not going to adapt in a matter of 10 years. And it can take hundreds, thousands, millions of years for a species like a vertebrate to evolve. Um, to, to accept those new sort of changes or um, become acclimated to those new changes. So rather what you see is organisms will move to stay with where they're comfortable, right? If it's cooler farther north, they'll tend to migrate north. Um, when that happens, we call that a range shift. You guys remember what range is where you find an organism naturally, right? If that moves, if the organism moves with its adapted uh, environmental norms, that's a range shift. 
As species move, they can encounter gaps in habitat due to fragmentation. So you may not have an entire contiguous grizzly bear habitat because, okay, let's look at the map. Here in the darker brown color, that's historic grizzly bear habitat, okay? Um, up here in the red stripe, that is polar bear habitat, okay? And then we'll look at this pan piece in a minute. This is the extended range of the grizzly bear habitat. The grizzlies have shifted, that a range shift, right? You find them up in, in uh, Northern Canada and Alaska, where you used to just find them down this in this brown area, right? So what do you think happens if you are a grizzly bear who lives here in California and you need to shift northward? Are you going to have a contiguous forest through which to travel? Absolutely not, right? So we're talking about fragmentation of habitat. You're going to hit a place where you can't, I don't know, cross a highway, for example. Right? So you end up with species that are trying to move but can't. And so for a grizzly bear, that's that's clearly something like an interstate highway may present a, may present a, a boundary, but it may not. It may just run across, right? But if you're looking at something like a plant, right, that can't get up and run across the highway, you can't disperse your seeds further north if you can't grow in the in-between space. Does that make sense? So some species can't do a range shift because they're limited by mobility um, or even just suitable habitat. There may not be any more suitable habitat. So that's a, that's a way that shifting uh, temperatures can affect ranges of organisms. But let's say with our grizzly friends, they managed to do this range shift and now they're up here at this farther northern range. Now they're, look at this, what is going on here with the red stripes and the pan? What is happening right there? Overlap. Hmm? Overlap. Overlap of what? The polar bear. Polar bear range and grizzly bear range. What do you think happens when a grizzly bear meets a polar bear? Fight. Probably, right? So you can introduce competition that didn't exist before. How nice are grizzly bears? They're so warm and fuzzy, right? No, they're murderous. <laughs> they're very aggressive, right? And what about polar bears? Snuggly like the Coke bear for Christmas time? Also, no, murderous, <laughs> very aggressive. So absolutely they can compete, compete, but interestingly, they may also hybridize. You guys ever heard of a pizzly or a growler? Some people call them growlers. What I'm talking about. Because you can already imagine what I'm going to show you, can't you? I love how I start typing pizzly, and the first thing I get is pituitary gland and then pizza. You ever wonder what Google thinks about you? Check it out. I want it. Oh, uh, don't, don't, don't you if you want to a pet pizzle? I want to be a great house dog. Yeah, be a great, a great house pet, right? With kids. Yeah, they're great with kids. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but this happens, right? So that is a hybrid species because they're not, it's two different subspecies of the same kind of bear, essentially. So they're not really so separate uh, genetically that they can't reproduce. So they just are. Um, separated by range historically. So you've got isolate, uh, genetic isolation because of uh, space, right? Spatial isolation. But now if you overlap the ranges, you don't have that anymore. So maybe they fight, maybe they compete, or maybe they hybridize. And there's a new bear that we didn't have before as a result of, of climate change. Is that bad or good? Or neutral, right? In the case of the Pizzly, who's it hurting? Right, so the, the, the thing is, we honestly don't know, right? We don't know the long-term effects. Again, speaking to sort of the short-sightedness of our tendency to just move forward in the name of progress without looking at what we may not even be able to see yet as, as far as long-term consequences. So those are just some examples of what you might actually, how you can see the effects of climate change on living things, which I think is important to think about because they seem like two um, disconnected topics. When you, when you sort of first start discussing you know, conservation versus climate change, it's kind of like, well, yeah, it's getting warmer, weather's getting rougher, but why does it matter to uh, biological species? So besides just that example, um, there are also temporal changes that can happen or, or changes related to timing 
things like food availability and breeding season. So if you're a migratory species and you go somewhere to breed in the spring where there's usually abundant food, but when you arrive, your food source has already flowered and uh, gone to seed because it's warmer there, that can be a problem, right? Or uh, flowering time and pollinator arrival, same story. The pollinators arrive at a certain time and the flowers are leaving out, but the flowers have already come out and died because it's warmer. Um, but pollinators can respond to that change. So you're looking at species interactions, community interactions that may or may not occur uh, if timing is related at all to seasonal temperature. Okay? So this is just the tip of the proverbial iceberg as far as uh, impact on living systems, but at least it's a good place to start thinking about it, you know, sort of how, how it matters and why it matters. Okay, so this is the last thing we'll talk about until we watch our video on, on Monday together for those who decide to come. Uh, what can you do? This is a big problem, right? Lots of big challenges, conservation, biodiversity. You're just one person. What do you do? Just close your eyes, right? Some people choose to do that, right? That's legitimate, that's a strategy. Um, you are not expected to change the world. No one thinks you're gonna do it all by yourself. In fact, most of the onus falls on industry and government. Right? Because we are just individuals and I can recycle or eat vegetarian or do whatever I do to try to make my impact less, but I'm just one person, right? So you're really most powerful here, right? Voting. And I know this is not a government class, but I'm going to say it anyway. This is where your voice comes from, right? You let your, your policymaker know where you stand. Policymakers know where you stand on these types of issues. And that's really the most powerful thing you can do, but you should also realize that your choices do matter. So don't just close your eyes and throw your water ball out the window. Okay, so please don't do that. Um, be a conscientious consumer. Make uh, an effort to sort of know what your choices are doing, like the companies that you're buying from. Is your coffee safe for birds? Who knows? Right? Those types. Of things. Whatever matters to you. Think about what you do. Think about how it affects the environment. Do what you can to reduce your own carbon footprint. Think about your actions. Right? There are very, very easy things you can do that are super small and not expensive and not hard to do, just changing your mindset, right? Don't do everything at once. But like, get a reusable water bottle, right? Or turn off the lights when you leave the room, for example. Where does your electricity come from? Yeah. Probably some sort of fossil fuel, at least part of it. And a lot of our power around here comes from hydroelectric, which is cool for the dam. Alton Dam generates some power. We still use a lot of coal, right? So, yeah, when you leave the room, turn off the lights. Little things, right? Just think about your impact. But that's all I ask of you. Can you, can you do it? Can you handle it? You probably already do, you conscientious young people do. All right, that's it. That's Biology 11 away. Congratulations, you made it. You survived. You did it.